So this, you're not saying, do you know you need this? <laughs> that's what I say no. at the door. Oh, <laughs> yeah. After I take the ski mask off, that's generally my first question. Would you like to buy some life insurance? <laughs> right, right. Everybody needs life insurance. Right. Am I right? Am I right? But, Am I right? But it's a micro agreement. Don't you agree you need there you yeah. Go. Yeah. A micro agreement? I'm learning. Yeah. Hello and welcome to episode six of the Life Insurance Academy podcast. I'm your host, Austin Lopes Silvero, and I'm here with Chris Ball, Zach McElwain, and Roger Short. The LIA podcast takes you out of the classroom and into the conversations of top producing agents in life insurance sales so that you can level up your business. For cliff notes and resources, visit liapodcast.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Life Insure Acad. Thanks for joining us. We're in the middle of a series where we're taking a deep dive into each of the five real reasons why people don't buy. Now, we touched on them a little bit in episode three and four, just a quick overview. And last episode, we went into trust. But today, now today's topic is people always buy what they want. Uh, Guys, do people want life insurance? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's a good question. That's a great question. Uh, we didn't discuss this. I'm going to tell you my answer. Oh, probably not. <laughs> yeah. I was I was going to say no. You're going to say, say no. no. So yeah. then, how do you all have jobs? Like, how is this a career? <laughs> that's a, that's Jedi, another good question. Jedi mind tricks. <laughs> no, right. Because at the end of the day, life insurance is a piece of paper and a promise. They don't want to buy life insurance, but. They also don't want to be the one that leaves their family completely stranded um, and leaves them um, without hope, without a home, without uh, financial means to take care of anything. Now, do they know that? No, not necessarily. I mean, no. But, but I think something inside of them makes them feel it. That's mm-hmm. that's a great way to say it. And that's why I, I, I say whenever they receive this this paper or saw something, there's this event, whatever, that they, they hit a nerve in their heart. They don't have the language. We talked about that on a previous podcast, but they they may not know they need it. Um, and because we've done this long enough, we know they need it. And there's a conversation that happens between between the Did two. Did you always know that they needed it though? Like no, no. <laughs> well, I, you know, so here people don't really ever think about it or even care to think about it until there's someone else in their life that they care about. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. And, and people don't really even make the commitment to it until there's a significant life event. People, you know, are, uh, people are married. They start having children. Right. Go ahead. Here's, ahead. here's a fact. Yeah. The, the Grinch didn't get life insurance until he had a relationship <laughs> with Mary Lou Who. Like that's, people didn't know that. He got yeah. a mailer, and then his heart grew 10 times bigger. Yeah. And now he he's got He didn't really care about his no, dog. He didn't. Uh, no. No. Poor not like you and Ruffles. Yeah. Well, yeah. We weren't going to say his name on the podcast. But <laughs> we just we'll did. Just leave it we just did. So, yeah, people, people generally don't start thinking about it until there's someone else that they care about, until something happens... You know, it prompts this idea, this nerve, maybe. You know, obviously, we're sitting with people for a reason, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it's not very it's not very apparent. I want to answer your question about did we always know it? You know, when I when I went out, I watched I watched the master sitting here. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll start to tear up just thinking about oh, watching gosh. Roger sell life insurance. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, uh. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, watching watching Roger make it make it look easy, and then I went out and my hands were sweaty, mom spaghetti, all that stuff that Eminem <laughs> talks about, oh, and <laughs> started door knocking and doing doing the sit, and I started started getting some some sales, uh, but I started to realize, you know, one there's there's every once in a while there's a what we call a lay down in the business and. And you know they open the door, it swings open. They say, "Oh, you must be the insurance man. Can I give you a check?" You know, that, <laughs> that, that happens wow. one in ten thousand times. Ten. Never, never. Oh, okay. okay. That happened never. <laughs> right? It doesn't it's seldom? No. Uh, but seldom. I, I like how you gave it like a little opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Where do I write the check? So. Then when that happens, can you let me know? Yes, it I will be a day to remember you. in the life of our friendship. <laughs> so. Uh, when when I started, I I felt like I was getting by on my personality, and 
Just, and your good looks. And yeah, that was the joke. I, you know, <laughs> your like, charming good looks. My, on charm, personality, joking with mm. people, connection, being able to connect. The funny man. But it, it didn't take long for me to realize uh, it's hard to keep business that way on the books because they like you when you're there and they don't when you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I don't think it's that they don't like you. It's like, uh, what do we get? Do we need this? Yeah. Or yeah. why do I have this? They and, did something because they liked you. Yeah, they, don't, they didn't know why they needed it yeah. or bought it. Yep. And I feel like for me, it's uh, because I didn't have that. I think I was fortunate enough to have uh, a good enough connection with somebody in the business like Roger that I could say, I think I'm missing something. I had some self-awareness to be able to say, I, I have to learn the process, the sales skills, the mastering the craft uh, so that he could, you know, so I could learn from him to be able to do that. I think one of the biggest, I think one of the biggest drawbacks to these laydowns, and, and a lot of agents will get into this rut. So if you're listening to this podcast today and you're a new agent just coming into the business, or you've been into the industry for a while and you're having mediocre success, okay, mediocre, like you're you're in that just over broke <laughs> level of living. <laughs> we call it a job, right? Just <laughs> over broke, and you're you're not having success. You sell enough to get by, but it's not enjoyable. You're you're not maximizing the opportunities, and you don't know why. Like some with some clients, it's really easy, and others you just get stonewalled. It's because you haven't practiced your craft to realize there's a skill set here. There's a psychology of the sale that you need to continue. That's why we talked about the five real reasons why they don't buy. And understanding if we don't uncover the need and then establish their want or desire as, relate, as it relates to that need, and we're just nice to them and we make a connection and then we do our presentation, like we're only going to get by on our personality and good looks, what, one out of 10 times? Yeah. Two out of 10 at the mm-hmm. most? Yep. I mean, that's not enough to make a decent living. And so it's a learned skill set. Well, and then like if it's like Chris said, if they love you while you're there and they don't love you when you're gone, like <laughs> and that affects your business long term, right? Like there's, uh, they might cancel. And then, and I, I think you all mentioned, uh, what's it called? Chargeback, right? Yeah. Like, so then it's affecting your bottom line. And so like these are important, but. Like, how do we get to that point to develop that need to where they love you when you're gone, um, or they're happy about what you sold them, right? Like, you built the trust, but it, it can't just be trust, right? Like, I, yeah. I, I, I would imagine I would have to want it. Zach, how do you develop that like need and like want mindset to make it stick? Well, I'd say the biggest thing is is you don't develop it; you mm-hmm. uncover it, and it's already there. Um, they may not know it. You know it based upon your experience of other clients you've sat with. But like you said, if, if, if you don't, they like that personality. It's comfortable now, but as soon as they get a flat tire, as soon as Christmas rolls around, as soon as they raise the price of cigarettes, they look at their bill, they look at their bank statement, they're on a fixed income. What's the first thing's going to go? That thing. Not not the uh, coffee or the cheetah no, <laughs> that it, they right. want right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to be that. So... Um, you know, the first thing that we do is, is like it, like you said, understanding who our clients are, understand where they came from, um, and really getting a picture of their lives and what the hardships they've had, um, and experience with other clients that you had. Like at first, I didn't know any of that, and I was going in thinking, you know, hey, everybody just wants this cremation plan. That's it, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and nobody wants to buy that. But when you look at that, it's it's about gathering that information. And it's asking questions. And I know we talked about trust, but it's deeper than that. It's it's a whole nother level of trust. And what I mean by that is it's not the initial question you ask them. It's So listen. you're not saying, do you know you need this? <laughs> That's what I say no. at the door. No. Oh, <laughs> yeah. After I take the ski mask off. That's generally my first question. Would you like to buy some life insurance? <laughs> right, right. Everybody needs life insurance. Right. Am I right? Am I right? But, Am I right? But it's a micro agreement. Don't you agree you need the yeah. micro, yeah. micro <laughs> agreement? I'm learning. Yeah. yeah so. gonna, at the end of this podcast series, you're going to be our top producer, Austin. Mm. We'll Look see. at you. No, no, no <laughs> response. We'll see. Yeah, you get, I guess you got to earn that, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> but if you're not asking that, right? Like we all jokes aside, like you're not asking that like micro agreement question. Like, what are you asking? You're le- you're you're asking anything and everything. But the the most important thing is you're listening. You're listening more than you're asking, and you can only listen if you ask first. So it's the follow up questions. It's getting to know who they are as a family, as people, 
Um, but not just saying how many kids do you have. It's, you know, oh, do they live close? What's your relationship? What's, what's your, you know, best memory you had when they were growing up? Did they ever drive you crazy? It's getting to know them as a person because when you understand the clients and you're getting to know, you're, you're, you're seeing a picture of this family's demographic um, and the love they have for them, and then you're able to start in your mind identifying what possible needs could be. So you're gathering everything you know about their lives, about what they like to do, about what they spend their money on currently, um, you know, with the things they have in their living room or their driveway, or a big boat, you know, and we can get into those things. But, you know, it's seeing and understanding that and getting to know and connecting with a purpose on another level, not just to build trust, but to understand the risks this family would have if one of them wasn't here. Now, to to that point, like you listed some things that might be immediate needs, but Roger, you you kind of even think ahead of that of like things that they might not even be thinking of. Like, how do you um, bring up like, hey, yes, you might need to cover the um, expenses that you have day to day, like that Zach's talking about, but there might be expenses down the road. Like, how does that even get brought up? Well, I mean, there's. You're sitting with a younger family. They're looking to, they just bought a house, right? They received one of our, our mortgage marketing pieces, whatever. You're sitting with that younger family. They're thinking, I have a $200,000 mortgage. We're now married. Our combined income allows us to live here. Um, if something were to happen to me, I would want them, I would want my family to be able to stay here. Maybe there's one child. And um, that's so, like the in the phrase immediate. Like, yeah, okay, so, so that's, that's maybe what prompted that. But mm-hmm. what they're not thinking about is like all the living expenses that continue on. You know, it's the registrations for summer camp. Mm-hmm. It's it's the it's the application fees for the the four colleges that they're hoping their child is going to get into because they didn't get the scholarship that they were hoping for and now they need extra money and it's like $1500 just in application fees or in a in a, a tutor class because they need to bring their you know their SATs up like these are all things that or the wedding the they, wedding costs yeah. you know are you a dad of girls you know like i mean uh, i'm experiencing that now so these are all things that that people are not necessarily thinking about cost of living expenses going up um, uh, you know what happens to car payments you know, um, if your income is gone, how does your family survive? So the house is paid for, yes, but there's still there's years left of life, and especially if they have a young family. There's a, a tremendous amount right. of years right. that you you think you're always going to be there yeah. for them because right. you've always had a paycheck. I'm going to take care mm-hmm. of you. You know, your your mom and dad are going to be here for you. Well, let's exit one of from the picture and paint that picture. Chris talks about being the ghost of Christmas future mm-hmm. and you're not always thinking in context of that I mean sometimes when you're sitting with seniors you'll take them all the way to a funeral home in, in that picture right right yeah well I was gonna say as far as young families sitting with people in the mortgage protection sit I mean for crying out loud for our for our family we have we have a, a budget that we work off of and but but all this stuff that pops up I mean like we forget you know we just forget mm-hmm. like uh, you know, Cameron does jujitsu, and that's a hundred bucks a month. I forgot to put that in the budget, you know, or yeah. or the added trips that they go on that they're you know for for church that that we're paying for the extra fees for this and and all of that and being able to to have that conversation and and are those things that are important are they are they important enough to make a change? Right, like my, my middle daughter just got, just graduated college uh, with an education degree. She's now going to be moving into education, but her car that she's had and got her through college that she purchased, you know, that I helped her purchase when when she started out, like it's it's starting to get some age on it. And so uh, we brought it into the service shop, and the repair was sixteen hundred dollars. Like she doesn't have that money. Well, Zach she, does. How Thank you, she, Zach. That was awful. <laughs> she of she doesn't have that money. Like those things pop up mm-hmm. and. How do families deal with that? Well, when you're here in the present situation, you're always thinking, well, we can take care of it. Mm -hmm. Let's exit you from the picture. How do they navigate that? Mm -hmm. Where does that money come from? Or even like maybe you're still here, but like your income goes away. Yeah, you you might have an accident or you might be sick or you might suffer, 
you know, a heart attack or a stroke like my brother-in-law did a few mm -hmm. years ago and was no longer able to work. And therefore, the income into the house went down dramatically. And it impacted the financial situation of my sister and my brother-in-law in a significant way. You know, people don't anticipate that. But being able to ask questions and paint pictures and scenarios and have stories, right. uh, narratives about real-life situations, and then ask what they would do in that situation, it allows you to put them in scenarios where they're thinking about what they really want in life. Yeah. Because they're thinking, the reason why I've got Disney Plus is because me and my daughter love watching Disney Plus together, mm -hmm. right? I know it's only six ninety nine or seven ninety nine a month, right? But if I'm not here, who's paying for all the streaming services? Mm. Yeah. You know, and are they in this house? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or if I'm no longer able to support our family with all the main stuff, what stuff am I going to have to cut? Mm -hmm. Like this, this is a value point. So th these are all little things. But right. being able to have those conversations, all of a sudden it elevates value on this benefit that life insurance can provide, right? It's not about selling them, do you want to buy life insurance? Right. No. They they do want the lifestyle, the family, the memories, the, the, the those things to be secured, and that's what you're that's what you're talking right. about. They do, and there there are some phrases that are getting thrown around that I don't, you know. These are the highlights, whatever the noises are. Like these are the things they're surrounded with. They want their lifestyle to remain the same. They want their families to be taken care of. They love their people. Mm -hmm. And earlier, Zach. In his, you know, in the smooth way he says it, it's it's almost under the radar, but it's fundamental, foundational. Is it is discovered, not created. It's not mm -hmm. manufactured. You know, he's not making up a reason. It's mm -hmm. there. It's all we have to do is listen for it. So, you know, Roger talked about the, you know, on an MP side, a mortgage protection side, some of those conversations. Uh, Zach, you probably have a couple of final expense thoughts for that. Yeah, I mean, like the biggest thing here is, is I don't want to. I want to be in the home to help a client, right? I don't want to sit there and tell them what their need is. Like, hey, I've done this a lot. This is what you need. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> yeah. So you've heard people say, "Assume the sale," right? Mm -hmm. You can't assume the need. That's very because if well you said. blow past assuming mm -hmm. the need, you only get the laydowns. And yeah. so, Zach, when you're sitting with those clients, how does that go? So you're not assuming the need and blowing. Well, past the first thing is, even if you assume the need and you're right, you don't know how much. That is, and you're probably only right a small percentage of the time, right? Mm -hmm. But it's it's about yeah. it's about giving them questions and painting that picture the same as in any other cell, um, and to where you can um, help them start to realize it. And when you do it right, and I'll give you the exact questions that I ask the client. But when you do it right, you can literally visually see them going from need to want in front of you. By their emotions and and their reactions, um, you know, to this, and and it's just being real with them, and it only works if you have that trust and that connection, and it doesn't work at the door after you take your ski mask off, right? Right. <laughs> it doesn't work, but after you have that, and you go through, and, and and you teach them a little bit, and you go through, and you say, you know, wait a second, are you going to do some questions? Li podcast uh, exclusive. Those those are. Aren't we? Those are nineteen ninety nine a question. Is that right? <laughs> is that what we're charging for those? Are they gonna pay in Bitcoin? Yeah, Bitcoin <laughs> only. Bitcoin or Ether. We'll take Ether. Not Ethereum. Ethereum. <laughs> Ethereum. That's what it is. Ether I was gonna is, say, is Ether different. a new thing? <laughs> no, I don't no, think I, people I, want that. It, wrong. Or it's, vintage Lego sets. Maybe not that. Never mind. We'll just take Bitcoin. Chris is Go trying ahead. to close another. Story. Yeah, <laughs> that, that went way <laughs> off. Fast. But, but the first thing is 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 to simply ask them. You know, what would happen if you passed away today? But it's not what you say; it's how you say it, right? It's 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 that empathy. That's that leaning in. It's that lowering your voice after you have that connection, and you can't stop there, right? Who would be affected the most? Now. Hence, this is the going to be the beneficiary, or this is mm. the person that they're thinking about in their mind. You know, um, you know, how would this burden fall on them? Would they have to pay for that financially? And do they have the funds for that to take care of all of those expenses? Because now they're thinking, oh, I've never thought about that. Yeah, that would, that would affect my, my daughter, Jenny. Um, no, she does not have that money. She's got three kids. And I would have, you know, how would that affect her family? Would that affect your grandkids? Right? In You're even changing your voice now. I mean, like, yeah. but the biggest thing is, it's it's not like these questions. It's I'm almost 
shocked they don't have anything or I'm I'm helping them realize like oh my gosh like I never no I've never thought that this would not allow my uh, grandkids to go to jujitsu mm-hmm. because that's not in their budget. Right. This would not allow my kids to play on the sports team that that travels every now and then and costs money. This takes away their family vacation. It pulls them out of private school. Whatever those factors are, they're not thinking about this right now. And so when you can start thinking about that and you ask them, how would that make you feel? I'm not telling him, the client again, that... Hey, if you don't do this, your your grandson's not going to go to jujitsu, right? Right. <laughs> There's a difference in how those yeah. questions it's, and it's statements your, it's were you're made. asking with care and concern in your voice, and they're the ones realizing that, and you know, and it all comes down to the four letter word of love. And when they see the impact as they're going through that, you're asking them, how, you know, I can tell this is really important to you, isn't it? Right, and. Once they go through that, it's not about them. It's about their heart. It's about that person. It's about that love. It's about preventing the absolute worst that could happen to your family. And in that moment, that becomes a want. In that moment, that value just went through the roof above those packs of cigarettes. Mm. Above probably a lot of things that they're buying. Like, uh, like it sounds like once you're asking these questions, like then they're having to determine what are they putting above their family. There's a common one that surprises me. I don't know if you guys, I'm looking at you, Austin, and you've never <laughs> run into this. <laughs> but you guys have no never run into this. <laughs> Is what happens to a married couple when somebody passes or when a spouse passes? 70%. That's a totally made up number because of how long it took me to say it. Uh, you know, many times, many times they have no idea what that looks like when the other spouse passes because they're just thinking, and this is in a, you know, uh, social security final expense conversation that we're having. And uh, they're just looking for a cremation plan or a, a burial plan. But they a don't, cheap one. Yeah, a cheap one, right? But they're not thinking thinking about that. A lot of clients don't even assume that they're not going to receive their spouse's income anymore. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's fine. You know, we already got some coverage in place. You know, she's got seven thousand dollar barrier. If yeah. that was the only need in the home, then they would probably be okay. Yeah. Yeah, they they never they. Seniors, most of them, do not process the idea that their household income is going to be cut in half or greater. Mm. And then how do they continue to live? They're just thinking about the seven, ten, twelve thousand dollar funeral benefit. And that's what was on their mind because their sister just passed away and they knew the funeral was ten thousand and they look in their own bank account and there's one thousand two hundred dollars in there, but that's because they just got their social security deposit three days ago and they still have that, you know, they've got another 23 days or 26 days to go till the end of the month before they get their next one because they're living on a social security fixed income. They're not thinking about what happens. He makes 1200, she makes 1100, he passes away. Well, according to social security, she gets to keep the higher of the two, but their household income just went from 2,300 a month to 1200 a month. That's a 50% cut. Mm. Right, that's twelve to thirteen thousand dollars in annual income that's no longer going to be there for the rest of her life, in addition to having to pay for a funeral. And here's the thing for the listeners: I mean, if if you've been in any home one time, how many clients have a ton of money left over each month? They're on a tight budget. They're on a fixed income. Sometimes they're slightly backwards in some months. Zach, most Americans, right. most Americans, right? The, but, the stat is that the average American spends one hundred and eighteen percent of their annual income. So when you think wow. about that, Jeez. it's called credit cards, credit cards. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. But when you think about that and you hear that, that they're going to lose that percentage of their income in a very limited household anyways, that literally there's not a budget for home repairs or new roofs or furnaces. You know, there's not in this demographic, you know, so that is a huge impact as far as looking at that need of that loss of income for all of those other things. From an empathy side, like I'm already getting sad, like for for these people, like how do you discover and uncover this without overwhelming or like, I mean, just burdening people? Like, what's? I'll tell you, I know that I know that sounds like it's something you'd want to avoid, 
but I don't. Especially for non-confrontational right. people. Yeah. yeah, and I am a non-confrontational person, even saying so that. So is this guy. Right. Uh, yeah. I might be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to confront you. When I said this right. guy, I was I feel, I feel like we're confronting each other, and I'm we're, uncomfortable with it right now. Yeah, you need to stop arguing. I quit talking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I started to learn uh, that I needed that un- discomfort. I needed the discomfort uh, and that's why I say the ghost of Christmas future. You know, you're taking mm-hmm. him into the reality of the future, and it's uh, it's touching their heart. You know, the the important thing to remember there and think about it is, you're an advocate for that beneficiary. Right. You are fighting for the one they love the most mm-hmm. right here, mm-hmm. not the client. They're not going to get a brand new truck and cruise around town right after they pass away. Right, they're not, they're not going to do it. A lot of times clients will say, oh, well, I don't want them to get rich off of this. I don't know if you've heard that before. And I'm like, <laughs> don't worry, they're not. I mean, this yeah. is, there are so many added expenses that they're not thinking through. But that discomfort piece, that is the, the moment of ownership. And I, I will pause. I will pause. And then my... To friend, let it sit there. To let it sit, yeah. Because you want them to be thinking of that emotional weight. Mm-hmm. Right, so when you're saying how do you how do you do it without burdening them, mm-hmm. you have to have the discussion for once, because in this moment, because people put it off, mm-hmm. it's, it's like I don't want to buy a piece of paper and just spend send money to an insurance company and I'm never going to receive anything. No one wants to sign up for that, right? But when they feel the emotional weight of what happens and the peace of mind that can be had with such a small investment to protect their family, to protect the ones that they love the most. You have to let them feel it for a moment. But the trick is, it's not a trick. The, 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 the process for you as an agent is to move from you saying it to having them say it. Them. They need to say it. Yeah. When, when clients, when people verbalize their needs, as Chris always says, that need becomes a want. Yep. And people always buy what they want. Sometimes it's they're buying it because they understand the gravity of the situation. Other times they're 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 buying something because they want a, a new thing. Yeah. So um, that that moment, um, you know, I'd rather them feel it now than their family feel it later, mm-hmm. right? Um, and as they're sitting there, my after the pause, my next question, and these are those those questions that Zach talks about that matter so much, is how does that make you feel? When you consider... Hey, man, you use my questions? <laughs> That's 1999. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pay you in Bitcoin shortly. Um, but how, how does that make you feel? And that was a, that was a question I was, I was uncomfortable with, you know? And they'd say, well, not good. Not good. And that's a place you need to land. Mm-hmm. As you get established in the industry, you'll start having stories. Mm-hmm. You'll start developing stories. Because Chris, I think you mentioned on a previous podcast in the number of years you've been in the business, how many death claims have you had that you've assisted with? Over 30, yeah. Yeah, so these are 30 families that were dramatically impacted because of the loss of a loved one. But because of a benefit that was in place and what Chris did at that moment, it, it made a tremendous difference. So that, that burden now that they're feeling, that burden now that they're feeling, uh, even though it may be uncomfortable, it's it's much smaller than the burden that their family's going to feel later, and it's okay to say that, like, say that. Like, what you're feeling right now is much smaller than what your family will feel later if it wasn't in place. Like, I know that's heavy on you right yeah. now, but yeah. like, we need. Do you say we need to take care of this so your family doesn't feel this later, or do you let? I would like, ask how- them to say, "How would you like to take care of that so they don't have to feel that later?" Okay. I tell you, with that, Austin, I also say what you said in the key word there, and you didn't even realize it because you've never been in the field. We, we're, it's always together, me and okay. the client. We look at you. We're <laughs> always you. He's doing all that. giddy, like so he's all bubbly any, now. Anytime in my Green entire, you know, sitting with a client, it's always we. I have that mentality. I'm, we're going to do this together. We're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to help take care of, you know, Jenny or whoever. Um, but another tip to kind of help with this. This one's probably not twenty dollars, but. Always ask about their parents. And here's why. Chances are, in, in a final expense, they're most likely have already passed. Okay? So if they did have insurance, wow, that was amazing. Your mom cared about their family so much that you know she didn't want to leave that burden on you. How was that dealing with that? What would happen if she didn't leave that burden on you? Or if she would have left that financial burden on you, how would you would have handled it? 
well, that affected your family. Or the other side of it, mom didn't have any coverage. Oh, wow. Was that really hard on the family? How did you do that? Well, and I had a, I just had to sit yesterday, and this is the, you know, the story from that. Well, it was hard. I was working two jobs, and the rest of my family really wasn't doing much of anything and didn't have anything. So what they did is they all looked at me. I had to take on that entire burden and pay for that. And it took me years, and it just it took every amount of emotional and financial energy I had uh, to do that. I said, wow, that, that's, that's really amazing. And, and you would never want to do that to your family or leave that if you had the opportunity to, right? So when you ask about the parents, whether they had everything in place or they didn't, either way, it, it helps to paint the value of yeah. protecting the loved ones. And, and like it sounds like, you know, the, the need and the value, it's not just on the financial side. Like if you're talking about, you know, one of the kids had to take multiple jobs when the rest of the kids, you know, weren't contributing, like that affects like family dynamics. Yes. Like what, how do you want your family to look like after you're gone? Are, is, yeah. are all of your kids still like communicating? Are they still loving you or loving each other the way that you want them to? Like, Dude, he would, he would do so well on the field. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, Those had are great a, I had a client one time, Austin, I sat with this, uh, this man, he was probably in his mid to late fifties. And, uh, when I first went in, um, to see him, he said, come on in uh, a friend, a neighbor actually opened the door and said, come in. I went in and sat down. I realized that he had had a stroke and he was paralyzed on one side and he had limited ability. We got talking about, you know, his situation, what they were looking to accomplish, what he was looking to accomplish. He didn't have a wife and no kids or no, he did have, he did, he had two kids, but he was no longer married. And uh, we got talking about his situation. And I said, what prompted you to even, you know, respond to one of our pieces? You know, uh, what got you thinking about this in the first place? And uh, he said, well, I just don't have any coverage and I need some. How much is it? Right? So for and the you not, said, for And the you novice, said, like, Chris, like, is, that, is there something on the stove? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. for the novice. Is that your daughter? <laughs> for the novice, like the, the, uh, someone, they might get right into that. Okay, well, I can help you get that. And you go right into your presentation. You start giving pricing. We haven't yet uncovered anything, right? So even though that might sound like a buying signal, you assume the need, and assuming the need is disaster. Mm-hmm. And so I had to dig into that. Well, why did you think you needed it? You know, what, what's the purpose of it? Well, I want to have it for my kids. What's creating that urgency for you? Uh, you're no longer where your kids live. What's the situation? Tell me about your parents. Zach's question prompted my thoughts here. Well, that's one of the biggest reasons why you're here today. And then he went into this whole story about how his dad passed away and his sister who had this really good job and his mom who was living on basic social security and he uh, together, didn't, his dad didn't have any insurance and his sister, who could have afforded, according to him, to cover the entire thing, took over and made the arrangements and called them and said, I need, I need $1,500 from each of you, and we need it by this day for the funeral. And so they paid it, and they thought they were done. The day of the funeral, they get home, and the sister calls and says, now I need another 2000 from each of you. Well, what's that for? Well, it's for the balance. We thought that was the entire amount. We don't have that. Mm. Well, you're paying your fair share. I'm not paying this whole thing. It caused a rift in that family. He hadn't spoken to his sister in three years because of what happened. And she wouldn't let him see. And then they found out later that his dad did have a life insurance policy and never told anybody. And it paid out three years later, and they each got a portion of it to cover the funeral costs. But dad had this policy put in place, didn't tell anybody. The sister didn't. And they, they, they come to find out when they got through his bank records and saw there was a payment and someone figured it out. And, but it caused a rift in that family for like three years that still was not resolved. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes. And he said, I never want my kids to fight like that over me, over something that I could fix right now so that they'll never have to do it. They love each other now. I don't want anything ever to come between them. And and that's the point, you know, you've uncovered the need. We were there. It's so much different than how much is it. Right. Oh, well let me let me give you a couple prices right here and sign you up and leave. We were there. So I couldn't now I was helping him get what he wanted. I was no longer a life insurance salesperson. I was now an advisor. We had developed connection. I connected with a purpose through core. I was asking good questions. We transitioned into identifying the need. 
And then when he started verbalizing that, that became his want. And then I figuratively and physically moved from across the room to beside him on the couch. I then walked him through some options, affordability. We talked about the other two things and, and we put his policy in place and got his application done. But completely different. It opened everything wide open by asking some follow-up questions. Why is that important? So, yeah, you, you got to dig. Should every sit have that moment? Mm, like this was a pretty emotional moment for him. Mm-hmm. Not all of the sits are going to be like right. that. Mm-hmm. Some people are just not that emotional or they don't have something traumatic happen like that. Right. They're just more responsible people and they're just being proactive. But you can still get to the heart of the matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, the point is get to the thing where they elevate the value of their need so that it becomes their want. Did they say it? Did they say it? That's the big question. And if they said it, then you validate and you can move on. I say, you know, the thing that we do, if, if we're really wanting to be difference makers in our clients' lives, we do the same thing. We, we try to dig the same level. The one thing that we can't control is, you know, some people, um, they have different levels of care for their family. Um, and we just have to be able to find out what that is and help them take care of that level. And that's the reason why some people will sacrifice more of their budget to put more in place and some people won't. Like, I don't want to make them rich, like you said, Chris. But um, I feel like everything I do is consistent in the home. It's it's very duplicatable and it's it's it doesn't vary. The only thing that varies is that family dynamic and how they live and how important it is to them. How do you... Like, so if you've uncovered the need and they've voiced it, um, Zach, you mentioned like you're, it, it almost sounds like uncovering the need is different than how much they love their family. Like, can you kind of speak to that? Well, it's, it's the real need. And what I mean by that, uh, initially it might be, I need to take care of my cremation. But after we went through all this and asked the questions and they realize, and now it becomes a want, well, now it's, I want to make sure that, you know, my burial is fully taken care of. I also need some extra money in case I pass away. My wife will be able to pay for all the bills and live her normal life. Plus also, um, people don't usually die completely healthy, so there may be some medical bills there as well. And I also want to leave a little bit of money um, as a legacy, as an emergency fund, as a last thank you and a last I love you to my family. So where it initially, the initial thought was, I don't want them to pay for my burial, turned into all of these other needs and all of these other things that now I want to take care of. Um, this is, and, and why this is important Important is because uh, we, we recently had some conversations with some agents who who were uh, saying, you know, man, I'm, I'm getting these applications and they're, you know, $25 applications or $15 applications and they can't figure out why. Or uh, they don't they don't understand this that people typically will buy life insurance seven times in their lifetime seven times and uh, sometimes more right so uh, needs change people change but seldom seldom does an agent sit in a home and assess the true need because most of the time the need that they think isn't the need the real need the need they think is. I just need something for my cremation. Yeah, they're addressing the immediate need Correct. Or, or what they perceive as the immediate mm-hmm. need versus the long term. Even with that, Austin, like the immediate need to them is that funeral costs today, they don't even think that, hey, I'm, you know, I'm 58. Um, if I live to 80, what will the funeral cost be? How much coverage will I need to just cover that final expenses when I'm 80? They don't even think about that inflation or that cost, much less those other things I mentioned as far as medical bills, debts, loss of income, legacy, all of those other things are the side factor of that. So a lot of brand new or inexperienced agents will go into the home and sometimes the client will already have a coverage in place. Oh, I just want to be buried. I got 10 grand. And the agent goes, okay, Chris, I couldn't help this guy. He already had 10,000. What was I supposed to do? Ten whole thousand dollars. Right. And, and it was in a giant check. Right. <laughs> it's like the and we, in the back room. With balloons. And when you but when you think about that, and when you 
understand and you have the ability to find the real need in the home, a typical final expense client really needs uh, probably you know seventy to hundred thousand in coverage. Can the clients we serve really afford that? Nowhere close. But it's about taking care of as much as that need as we can comfortably afford. Talk about that for uh, the practicality of that. Okay, here's an example. If you have a married couple like Roger had mentioned, and their income's cut in half, that twelve hundred dollars. You know, as Zach says it this way, you know, they don't cut the light bill in half, they don't cut rent in half, they don't cut all that stuff in half. You still have to pay the same price. So income's cut in half. In a year, that's about $14,000. A $10,000 policy doesn't even cover a full year of a spouse's departure. Yeah. yeah but that's one year. Do that's you, one year. So if the, if the client's in their 60s, right? Mm-hmm. And just because he died, you know, she may get a new you know, a little bit more energy because maybe she was taking care of him because he was sick or ill or this or that. That doesn't mean she's going to die in one year. So besides that $10,000 policy, what if she lives another five to 10 years or 10 years of that? That's $144,000 in loss of income that she's experiencing. And right now, oh, it's day to day. They don't have a lot of extra money. Mm-hmm. So if you think about that, the burial, her future cost of burial plus the loss of income for X amount of years, plus a little bit of extra money to cover when the house needs a roof or the furnace or a pipe burst or the floor has a leak in it. Transmission uh, goes out you know, in the car. Transmission, cars grief. don't last forever. You name it, all of those other things that can hit you in life, that can come at any moment. And that's still not even leaving any money for the kids or any type of legacy, a few thousand here or there. So when you look at being able to take care of that full need to where that client wouldn't have a change of life if one of them passed away with any of those, it's a large amount of coverage. So anytime somebody says, I got 10,000 or even 20, oh, I got 20, wow. You know, I know that that's nowhere close to what they really, really need. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to be able to afford to get $100,000 right. of guaranteed whole life coverage. That, that Probably not. But I just want to, you know, it's to assess the real need and to see how important it is to them. And so they know um, they're doing the best that they can. And if they are... If they, if you um, uncover the need enough, and they recognize that need, and they vocalize it, and they say what they want, is there anything beyond like when we talk about uh, uncovering the need and the want? Is there anything else kind of to that want element? Um, Austin, I I sat with a uh, a couple that had just purchased a brand new home, beautiful new home. She designed it interior herself. I mean. It looked like it was an interior designer that did it. It was spectacular. The mortgage was $450,000. And he has a great job with Ford Motor Company, makes over 200000 a year. She was injured in a car accident nine years ago, got rear-ended at a light, is on full disability as a result of that. So she has some fixed income that's coming in. He has a pension through Ford. He's part of the legacy benefits before they made the shift years ago. And he also has a 401k. So she's going to get to recoup some of that even after he passes away or if he passes away before she does. But they're looking at this liability of this $450,000 mortgage, right? And he has a $280,000 policy through work. It's a supplemental policy in addition to the basic life insurance coverage that they offer through work. So a lot of people would say, well, this guy's got 400000 like in place already. Does he need another 400000 Well, the thing that they value is time with their family. Between the two of them, there's seven kids that have grown that have their own kids. They like to take them away on trips. They just got back from a cruise down in the Caribbean where they took the whole family, grandkids and all. There was like 17 of them, and they paid for the whole thing to go on this cruise over the holidays. She goes, we don't buy them Christmas gifts. We try to create experiences. Like, we value that. And we want to take them to, next year they want to go to Europe, somewhere over in Europe, and the kids are paying half. You know, they're going to pay half. And, like, they want that lifestyle and those th- types of things to continue. So his, you know, in, during our conversation, when we talked about where the money is going to be allocated, we discussed what they currently had, where that money is going, if there's a shortage of money, if he's become critically injured, chronically ill, critically ill, 
or unfortunately pass away, the most tragic of all, what happens to her? So the liability was completely on him to protect her because her income was a fraction of what the household income was. So it became very apparent once we started allocating where their value points were and what they wanted their life to be like, that they needed more coverage. And so uncovering that, asking questions about what the money's for, where's it going, what they want, what they want their life to be like if something were to happen, long-term care needs, like there's a lot of different conversations that went on in there. We ended up putting over 300000 in place for him and another 50000 in permanent coverage for her. And when I was done, uh, he's like, I, I think I need some permanent coverage as well. So once we get this done, can you come back? Because I'd like to put some permanent coverage in place now so I have that forever so that this other term can help me through the mortgage years. I just want to make sure we're done, man. Because like after talking to you, I realized like we need to have this stuff lined up because it'll make me sleep better at night. And so the value was elevated dramatically, but it was a it was a dissection of what they needed, questions, answers, follow up questions, asking value points, you know, and and, and, and not assuming it. Early. Not assuming it, no. No, you can't rush into that. So you have to connect with a purpose, but then your questions shift from identifying who they are and what their family was like to what you need and why do you want that. And so Roger, everything you said there like that lead card, mm-hmm. right? You didn't know no. <laughs> what you were mm-hmm. necessarily walking into. Maybe a little bit more than a final expense lead because you. Might if you want to spend a little amount. more money, you could get but, a private detective to tell you all this stuff. <laughs> right. But that, regardless of what was on that lead card and what you knew before and what you discovered, like that was still a person, right? That was still a family. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about need and, and discovering that need and discovering that desire, like it's not just um, about asking the questions to protect that name on that card. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, some people would jump right into that and say, so you want to cover the 450000 if something were to happen so we pay off the mortgage? Great, let me show you how to do that. Here's the thing, that's not that's not doing your job. No. That's not practicing your craft. That's not understanding your clients and really making a difference. That's taking orders and looking for laydowns. Right. And like the big thing on that is in a moment of change in that family's life, losing that person or that chronic injury or illness, they don't need more change. They want that consistency of life of like, mm-hmm. well, are we still going to go on a trip with mom and dad? You know, or is that is that gone too? It's, right? Is that gone awesome? That's a great Austin, it's saying, interesting right? because while I was there, one of their sons came over with a friend of his. One of their married sons came over with a friend of his. They immediately got up, disengaged from our conversation, and was so excited to see their son mm. that showed up, just popped in. And his son said, hey, can I go down and show him this? You know, Because they were just in their new home. Mm-hmm. And he had this area set up where he has this G.I. Joe collection, you know, this this... You know, fifty-eight-year-old man has a GI Joe collection from the nineteen sixties all wow. the way up. So, his grown adult son, who's married with his own kids, came over and they jumped up and totally disengaged with me. The value went to him immediately. So you could see how much they love their family and they respect each other. And when he was leaving, he gave his dad a hug. His dad hugged him. Like it's apparent. It's mm-hmm. clearly apparent. And if you're not paying attention to those cues, listening, following up, asking validating questions, where the value points are. It's easy to get into taking orders and assuming that it was, oh, it's about, let's cover the 450 and I'll move on to the next one. Yeah, like one agent would have said, oh, like they would have been upset seeing that sign come in. Well, you just ran my sit. Like you just interrupted me. How am I going to close now because you interrupted, right? Versus you're saying, no, I loved yeah. that he was there. I love seeing that because you saw the value even more. It validated you versus... Stop me. Yeah, I complimented them on on that relationship. I commended him on how much he loved his family. Mm-hmm. And then that brought value to mm-hmm. what he was trying right. to well, accomplish. And that probably brought back the conversation. And bringing in the, the injury that she had nine years ago and how quickly things can change and a story from my family, my sisters, whose husband you know had a stroke a few years ago. Like all those made our conversation very easy, normal, and the value was elevated tremendously. Because if you jump right in at the front end and say, I'm assuming this is about this 450000 so let me show you how you can do that. Here's some pricing options. We can do this one, and this one has these features, this one has these features, which one would you like? And they see a price of $380. They look at each other and they go, 
well, let's talk it over, okay? And we'll get back to you because we always talk stuff over. Mm. And you're going, okay. So the new agent's like, okay, when would you like me to schedule? Well, we'll call you. Maybe Thursday. Okay, I'll call you. And you're chasing that for two or three weeks and then it's gone and you wonder, man, those policies are too expensive. I don't know how to sell them. I did sales once. It was a tough racket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, the, it's, it's because you're shortcutting the system because someone once told you this is how it's done. They shortcutted the system and they got lucky once. You had to lay down. So do the work. Yep. Do the work. And I think uh, the, it starts with how you prepare and your mindset and going to serve clients, understanding that it isn't uh, just a card. It's not just a piece of paper. It's not just a sale. Uh, that, that was, Roger, that was something that I had to learn from the beginning. I mean, I, I told you, like, I did not want to do anything where I felt like I was, which is a funny thing to say to you, you know, like taking advantage of a senior attorney. Yeah. You're like, yeah. who do you think I am? I know. <laughs> and, but, but, and it was because I had a preconceived notion of sales and what I believed yeah. sales was and understanding that, uh, when I get a, a a request for information, that it's um, a person, and it's a person who has a family, and they love their family very much, and their family loves them very much, or there's somebody in their life that they cared about enough to request the information, and that's where it starts. That's good, Chris. I I think we. We could probably in there. He <laughs> closed it. You closed it well. well if people thanks, actually guys. listened all the way to the end, you get was, coffee. That was gold right there. I get coffee today. Yeah, coffee's for closers. And <laughs> well, you just <laughs> here's, here's the question: <laughs> Do you have life insurance? Uh, Do you have life insurance? Oh man! And that's a wrap for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Life Insurance Academy podcast. For Cliff Notes resources and some of the things that we covered today. Visit liapodcast.org slash EP6. That's liapodcast.org slash EP number six. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening right now and rate us five stars. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Life Insurer CAD. The Life Insurance Academy podcast is hosted, edited, and mixed by me, Austin Lopesavero. This episode was produced by Roger Short and myself. Our theme song is by Flashing Lights. We'll catch you on another episode, including next week's show entitled Super Bowl, Flash Sales, and Black Friday. Why do they work? Establishing urgency in your sits. Until next time, drive safely and go be a difference maker. <laughs>